So good to see each and every one. Good to, as Gary has already mentioned, to have our visitors. We appreciate so very much your being here. We encourage, you, we are encouraged with your presence and we hope that we can make you feel welcome that you'll be able to have opportunities to come back and be with us. In the announcements, I didn't think about this before the services, but Gary can put down one more individual and I'll make the announcement for him to also do so tonight. Many of you, I'm sure, know Bobby Robinson. If I'm not mistaken, I think maybe back through the years, he has probably held meetings uh, here at East Albemarle. Bobby is living in Kentucky at the moment, and he was taking some blood thinner medication and has been for quite some time. And he developed bleeding, hemorrhaging, and several doctors did several things trying to diagnose his case until finally, after the fourth doctor, he was able to determine that he was uh, bleeding through the blood thinning medication, but he can't go completely off of it. So the doctor is going to operate this coming Wednesday to put a screen in his heart so that the screen will catch the blood clots, but he will be put on a different blood thinning medication, a much less potent uh, and not the one that he has been on. So, of course, we all know that any time you go missing with the heart, there's always complications. So we, I asked you to pray because uh, Bobby and his first wife, Sue, were truly uh, great friends of Diane and I, and in fact, her whole family. Uh, Ruben and Deanna both uh, grew up with many weeks, uh, either us staying in their home or them staying in our home. So I truly appreciate the prayers that you might pray in his behalf, that all will go well for his surgery on Thursday. I want us to look in our study this morning at what we so often refer to as the Great Commission. If you will, turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew 28, let's read verses 19 and 20. Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, let's go to Mark's account of this same commission that Jesus gave that we just read in Matthew. In Mark chapter 16, let's read our, begin our reading with verse 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs which follow those who believe. In my name they shall cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick. And they will recover. Now let's turn to Luke. His account. In Luke chapter 24. And we'll begin our reading at verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you shall be witnesses of these things. When we look at the Great Commission that we've just read in these three passages, let's see what each of these has said, particularly concerning what Jesus commissioned the apostles to do. It is in Matthew's account that we see that they are to teach and we see that those that are taught are to be baptized and that is to take place in the name, the authority of Jesus. 
it is in Mark's account that we see the statements made that they were to go into all the world and preach. Those that believed, those that were baptized, the result would be they would be saved. It was in Luke's account that again, there is to be the preaching done of God's word and that the result should be the repentance and the remission of sins. So when we take these three accounts and we add the sum total of the things specifically mentioned in those three accounts, what we have is that in this great commission, the gospel is to be preached, is to be believed, there is repentance that needs to take place, there is baptism that is to be engaged in, and the result will be those that do such will be saved. You know, when we think about it, the book of Acts is a book of conversions. And then let us realize that really it's an inspired commentary on this great commission that we begin our study with. That Acts chapter 2 is the fulfillment of prophecy. And these prophecies are easy to remember. The prophecy of Isaiah in the second chapter, the prophecy of Daniel in the second chapter, and the prophecy of Joel in the second chapter, and Acts, the second chapter, where we see the fulfillment of those prophecies. And there is more teaching, excuse me, there is more teaching on this matter of conversion in the book of Acts than in any other book in the New Testament. What it does, it gives us the actual cases of those conversions. What we see is, too, the type of people to whom the gospel was preached and the reactions that they gave, people that were just common folks, right on up to those that were of high-ranking individuals, such as uh, those that we read about in the church at Corinth in Acts chapter 18, or at least when Paul preached to the Corinthian people in Acts 18. There was the chief ruler of the synagogue that obeyed the gospel. And not only that, we see the numbers of those that were converted. We see single conversions in a lot of those cases. But then we also see thousands being converted because of the carrying out of the Great Commission. And we see in the book of Acts what it was they were taught, and we see what it is that they did in regards to this Great Commission. So what I want us in our study this morning to do is to look at this second chapter of Acts. So if you just get your Bibles and turn to that chapter, that's where the bulk of our study will be concerning. And I want us to see that it's here in this chapter that we read about the conversion of 3,000. You see, up until now, the preaching that was given charge to be done in those great commissions that the different gospel writers gave, all of the preaching was only in promise when Jesus gave those gave that great commission. But now, now here in the book of Acts, this preaching, this teaching is being done. We know that the book of Acts, Peter refers to it as the beginning. You recall in Acts 10 that Peter preached the gospel to the house of Cornelius, the first time that the Gentiles had had the gospel preached to them. We know that this caused quite a stir. And so to the 11th chapter of Acts, when Peter goes back to Jerusalem, he has to give a reaccounting of those things that he did in regards to going into the house of Cornelius and teaching them the gospel. And in reference to that and the fact that the Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius and his house, Peter made that statement in Acts 11 and verse 15 that the Holy Spirit came upon them as it did on us at the beginning. And Peter is clearly referring to Acts chapter 2 
For as will be seen, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. So Peter uses Acts 2 in a way to describe the significance of this chapter. And oftentimes, in fact, I myself through the years have often made the statement and used this phrase that the book of Acts is the hub of the Bible. We know what the hub is. The hub is the center part on which everything else rotates. So that is what we see with the book of Acts. Everything that was prophesied in the Old Testament and in the Gospels came to their fulfillment in Acts 2. And then everything that we read from the book of Acts on to the book of Revelation refers back to that book. So it truly is the hub of the Bible, and rightly so. And what we see in this second chapter takes place on the day that was called Pentecost. It was one of the three annual feasts that the Jews had that God commanded under the law of Moses. It was observed on the 50th day from the Passover. The Passover, we know, was that feast that they were to remember as they were to always be mindful of how that God had brought them out of the land of Egypt, the land of bondage. So God said to observe the Passover. It was that last plague that God told Israel to put blood over the doorpost and lentils. And the, the, the angel of death would come that night and the when he would see the blood, he would pass over those houses. So that was the Passover, and God wanted Israel to remember that. So this is one, again, of those three feasts that took place on a yearly basis. But the Pentecost was a feast that was observed 50 days from the Pentecost. And how it was measured was they counted seven Sabbaths, seven days in a week, seven Sabbaths, seven times seven is 49, plus one made 50. And so the 50th day is what the word Pentecost means. It means 50th. It's also referred to in other places other than Pentecost. In Exodus 23 and verse 16, it's called the Feast of Harvest. We see a couple of places in Numbers and in Leviticus where the Pentecost is referred to as the Feast of Weeks. So what do you see those different terms? Just simply understand that we're most familiar with Pentecost because it's that significant feast that we read the most about in the New Testament as opposed, uh, not as opposed, but in addition to probably the second most would be the Passover. So really what we're saying is that this occurred in Acts 2 on Pentecost. And it took place in the third month of the Jewish calendar. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but I do have it spelt right on the chart, seven. And that is a month that our calendar corresponds to the latter part of our month of May. So here we see the, where the Pentecost and when the Pentecost is taking place. So let's look at Acts 2, the conversion of these 3,000. And let's look at the account that we have given to us here in this second chapter. Let's call it truly the beginning, because that's what Peter calls it. And to begin, let's look at an outline. If we were to take the second chapter and just outline it, here's what we would think would be able to determine. We see in verses 1 through 13 the receiving of the Holy Spirit on the part of the apostles. In verses 14 through 36 of the chapter, we have Peter delivering the sermon that was preached upon this day. We have in verses 37 through 41 the response of those that heard Peter's preaching. And then, of course, in verses 42 through 47, we have the 3,000 disciples continue in the apostles' doctrine. So this is just a brief outline of what we see in the second chapter. So let's begin with the receiving of the Holy Spirit on the part of the apostles. 
The apostles received the Holy Spirit, and when they did so, they were able to speak in tongues. Let's look at verses, first four verses. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Then let's begin our reading in verse 5, and we'll see what the response or the reaction of the multitude. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judah and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pantheia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, adjoining Cyprus, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Christians and Arabs, we hear them speaking in their own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said, they are full of new wine. So what we see in this section of Acts, where the apostles have received the Holy Spirit and are now speaking in tongues, all of the different tongues, languages, that those of the Jews that had gathered there in Jerusalem to observe the Pentecost, those in the audience, we know are in sin. We know that they, however, <laughs> think that they're okay. They're there to observe a religious feast, very religious minded. So they thought they were okay. And they were some that had knowledge of the things that Peter is talking about and the apostles are talking about. It was just not only Peter, but there were other apostles, but we only have the verbatim words recorded of that which Peter spoke on this occasion. So next we have Peter's sermon. And that we said was from verses 14 to verse 36. In Peter's sermon, we find that he gives an explanation of the events. Because again, going back to verse 7, they were all amazed and they were marveling, saying to one another, look, are not all these that speak Galileans? And so, verse 12, they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what could, whatever could this mean? So Peter now is given an explanation of those questions, of the reactions that they're having. Let's begin our reading with verse 14. Then Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my manservant and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heavens above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you, by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being determined, I'm sorry, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God you have taken by wicked hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up 
having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I shall not, I may not be moved. Shaken, I'm sorry. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not have my soul, you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Many brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. For he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of whom we are all witnesses. Wherefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he said, he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know that God has made this Jesus, whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Let's notice these verses that we've read. Again, look at verse 17. We find that Peter gives a quote here from Joel, the second chapter. For Joel said, It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on thy men's, men servants and on thy maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. So in giving explanation to the people of what they have seen and heard concerning the Holy Spirit coming upon them, Peter refers to this revelation of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel that he prophesied concerning this very day, these very events that were taking place. And then that's we beginning with verse 19. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. This, of course, is figurative language. It's symbolic language that we see mentioned numerous times on various different situations. It was used in reference to the destruction of Babylon on the part of the Medes back in the days of the Old Testament. It was used in reference to the destruction of Egypt in the days of which we read later when Israel made that alliance with Egypt. But yet there would be these things, and along with it, the signs of the new heaven and new earth, which are not mentioned here, but the same language that we see, the same language that is even mentioned by Peter. But all of this indicates a new, a different time, a different thing that is about to happen. And surely what happened in Acts 2 succeeds all differences that ever occurred in mankind's existence whether it was back under the Old Testament or now as we see here in the very book and the very chapter that we often refer to as the hub of the Bible. So we see here the confirmation of the prophecy that Joel makes reference to. And then Peter, makes, rather, Peter continues to quote Joel in verse 21 when he says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So here we see the salvation that is to be the result of these things that are transpiring upon this day. So we see that Peter explains, as we read, that Jesus is raised from the dead. And he says, you are the ones that have crucified him. 
than what we saw in verses 22, 23, and 24. Concerning this crucifixion, Peter said David made prophecy of that. And not only did David make prophecy of the crucifixion of our Lord, he made prophecy first and foremost concerning the resurrection of Christ. So Peter makes mention of this as a way of explanation. And he says that now this Jesus whom you've crucified is both Lord and Christ. In verses 32 through 36 that we bear. So let's see what they heard as a result of Peter's sermon. What they heard was resulted in convincing them of sin. What they heard was evidence that Peter gave concerning the resurrection of the Christ that they had crucified. Now we see the other part of what we have outlined for Acts chapter 2. And that is the response of the multitude. And that's in verses 37 to 41. They asked what to do. Let's read verses 37 through verse 40. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So they asked what to do. And we see the question that they asked there in verse 37. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And we see the answer. The answer, repent, be baptized for the remission, the forgiveness of sin, and save yourself from this perverse, or as the King James says, untoward generation. And then we read in verse 41, they that gladly received his word obeyed. So let's see what they were told. They were told to repent. They were told to be baptized. So how does Acts 2, now that we have read it through to the point that we have, how does Acts 2 and the conversion of these 3,000 people compare to the Great Commission that we began our study with? We saw what the summary of Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account was. So now let's look at what we see here in Acts chapter 2. We saw in verse, th verse 22, they heard. We saw in verse 36, Peter said, let all of the house of Israel know assuredly. So to know something assuredly is to believe based upon the facts that are so sure. We know that they were told in verse 38 and to both repent and to be baptized and the result of their doing that would be the remission of their sins. So what we have and what we see here is what Peter did on the day of Pentecost was an exact replica of the things Jesus said that were to be done when he gave that commission in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then we see that the disciples continue in the apostles' doctrine. Notice what we read in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. So they followed the apostles' authority, those 3,000 that rendered obedience. And we see that they were steadfast. Notice, in fact, a couple of things here in verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. So they were steadfast. 
they worship God. Verse 43, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And we see in verse 44, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So these 3,000 that had obeyed the gospel took care of those among them that were needed, those that were in need of the physical things, the necessities of life. And then we find in verse 46, we see that they served daily. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. So this was something that carried on continuously by these 3,000. And then the last verse, praising God and having favor with all of the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So they grew. This is what we see, the disciples and these early Christians doing after their obedience to the gospel. So, what did they become? They become active Christians, active Christians. What did they become? They became active, they continued to worship, they continued to be dedicated, they continued to be worshiping and being active in all of the things that we just read. Following the apostles' doctrine, steadfast, worship, feared, took care of the needy, served daily, and they grew, both numerically, I'm sure, as well as physically, but also spiritually as well. That's the only thing that can result. Those are the only two things that can result from what we see that they did. They certainly will grow spiritually because that's what it takes to continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine to be able to grow spiritually. But we see their zeal, their being active, their being thankful for what has happened to them, and now they're wanting to tell others about it as well. So what we've seen in Acts 2 and the conversion of the 3,000 is the account. Now, let's look at the summary, the summary of their conversion. Look at what they were told. What were they told? They were told that they were in sin. They, told, they were told that Jesus was raised from the dead. And they were told that they needed to repent and to be baptized. That's what they were told. What was it that they understood? They understood that they needed to be saved. They understood that Jesus is the Son of God. Their belief in him being the Son of God was not before the crucifixion. It was a result of this sermon. Now they're willing to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what they understood. That's what they needed to understand. And they understood they were going to have to repent and they were going to have to be baptized. How did they respond? Well, they responded gladly. They responded willingly in obedience to the things that Peter had preached to them. So again, we see the carrying out of the Great Commission here in Acts chapter 2 and the conversion of these 3,000 people on that day of Pentecost. I hope that we can begin on Lord's Day morning a series of lessons concerning, we won't get through all of the cases of conversion, but just again to remind ourselves, because that's what we must have our faith rooted and grounded in, is these first principles that we see in these conversions that we read about. 
and then hopefully to instill within us the zeal and the desire to share with others what has taken place with us. What a glorious, joyful, great thing that it is to have our sins forgiven. If we truly understand what sin is, and we truly understand how destructive sin is and the, the effects that it will have, not just only in this life, but also in eternity. That ought to create within us a desire. And hopefully by looking at some of these conversions, being reminded of them, I, I, I know that's all I'm going to be doing is reminding us, but sometimes we need to be reminded of those things that may have become a part of our lives earlier as being Christians, but, but now have sort of faded. Let's bring those things back to the front and realize and look at these conversions. And some of them, but not all of them. This morning, if you're here and you're in sin, did you do what these people did in order to have the forgiveness of sins if you believe that you are a Christian, if you believe that you are saved? Did you hear the word of God? Did you know it assuredly? Are you convinced that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you're willing to make that confession of the faith that you have? Are you willing to repent of sin because all have sinned? Are you then willing to be buried with Christ in baptism? Because that's what Jesus said all through the great, the great com the accounts of the great commissions that we read in those three gospel accounts. And it's what we see being carried out here in Acts 2. Baptism was just as much a fundamental part as the preaching and the believing of God's word. Does your salvation match the great commission? If it doesn't, it needs to. And the only way that you can have remission, the forgiveness of sin, is to do exactly what Jesus said in that great commission and what we see in the very first case of conversion. We have time and opportunity now. If you're here and you've obeyed the gospel, but yet you've sinned, you've not been faithful in whatever area of faithfulness that that may be, repent of your sins. If necessary, confess your faults one to another. Let us pray with you and pray for you that your sins be forgiven. Let our sins be forgiven by the blood of Christ through either obeying the gospel or as a Christian repenting and praying. And if we can assist you in either of these, let it be known why together we stand to sin.